and, and it's like, you know, he's, he, he sticks it back on everybody. I mean, I was in the movie theater when that, when those scenes hit where the camera cut right to the Korean grocer and then the white guy and then the black guy going, you know, screaming those harangues of epithets, racial epithets at each other. That movie was like a hand grenade. You know what I mean? I mean, that movie was like a hand grenade went off in the theater. Like, people, people were going, what? Like... Nobody said that stuff at that point. Even in 1989, you know, Public Enemy, that level of like of 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 expressed rage. And like I said, even I'd see an Annie Hall and things like that. But at that time, for me, that that movie mattered. Like like you know, you talk about things that influence. I, there's something. There's an appeal to, I guess, what I would call like um, powerful performances. You know what I mean? Like like obviously people my age. Uh, are, were very affected by De Niro. Which De Niro films are you thinking oh, about? Oh, you know, um, Godfather 2, Taxi Driver, Raging Bull, uh, King of Comedy. But is, I just wonder, is there a scene in King of Comedy, a specific scene, that really spoke to you? Well, over time, King of Comedy, King of, I, I've come to feel that King of Comedy, like, people have a, talk a lot about uh, Taxi Driver and Raging Bull, but, but Taxi Driver and Raging Bull, to me, are b brilliant films, brilliant Films, but but not really linked in a way. I think I think Taxi Driver and King of Comedy are actually much more linked as films in the sense that in both of those movies, Scorsese and De Niro together, I feel like are they're looking at the they're looking at what happens to people who get left behind by the American dream. You know, they're they're looking at a very they're looking at a very particular kind of pathology in those two movies, which is the the underbelly of of American life. You know, Taxi Driver is really about the dark underbelly of post-Vietnam American urban malaise. And, and King of Comedy is really about, you know, the underbelly of, of fame and like our, our, our obsession with achievement and television and fame and being known and stuff like that. And, and in that sense, I feel like Travis Bickle and Rupert Pupkin are, are really, really close cousins as performances you know they're, they're and they're and they're like I think they're just really really fantastic seminal pieces of work but there, is there a scene in, in King and Comedy that just made you kind of go oh my god what's there's a great scene in that movie that to me it, it totally captures that what they're exploring it's where where Jerry Lewis who's equally great in that movie kind of makes the decision to go out of his building and walk instead of running into the car and he and it's like he gets out and a cab driver goes by and yells something at him about the show and he sort of says oh I could have used you last night blah 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 and then a, the construction workers far away yell at him and, and he's nice and he waves back and as he goes down the street he ends up passing this phone booth you will not believe who's coming down the hill Jerry Langford right right oh Morris please hold on Jerry would you please sign my order I'll sign that magazine for me. yeah you're just wonderful I've watched you your entire career you're a joy to the world please Mark would you just please say something to my nephew Morris on the phone he's in the hospital I'm and sorry I'm late you should only get cancer I hope you get cancer and, and in that one scene it goes from we love you to I hope you die if you don't give me what I want. You know what I mean? And it's just like, that's it. That's fame. That's fame in America. It's like, it's like they absolutely love you until five seconds later, they're wishing cancer on you. You know what I mean? You're talking about influences, and we can't sit here and not talk about you having worked with an actor who's probably the biggest influence of in anybody in, in, in film, and Mar being Marlon Brando. Yeah, I think you would be hard pressed to argue that that he wasn't the most influential actor on many subsequent generations of American, not, and not just American film actors, all film actors, all actors. He, he, even though I think he never wanted to be saddled with it, he, he, he was one of those people who landed at the crosshairs of a moment where both what was going on in the culture, a sea change, a, a shift that the culture was ready to embrace anyway, m crossed with his talent, his very unique talent at a moment, and it ended up, it ended up turning him into this incredibly, incredi incredibly influential kind of um, paradigm-shifting 
artist. He, well, was he aware of how, he must have been, of course, but how sort of he rom romanticized he was by Kazan and on the waterfront, how he's really sort of made, he's, he's both sort of this tragic hero and an ingenue simultaneously. I mean, could you talk to him about that kind of stuff? I didn't know, not about that specifically, but something you just said is really interesting to me because you, you very rarely hear the word ingenue used to describe Brando. I mean, that's, that's like, I, but I think that's really insightful because if there's something that gets done to Brando that I think's like too reductive, it's that because of his big physical beauty, you know, last tango in Paris, these things, he's, he's seen as this iconically male figure. And because what he did that really, you know, just blew apart people's notions of what a screen performer was had so much to do with the way he was sexualized, you know, with, with that brutish yeah. masculinity that he brought to the screen in Streetcar. People miss that the real magic of him is that he's got this incredibly poignant vulnerability yeah. in him. It's like the most famous moment in Streetcar and in like half of American movies is when he screams her name. That is not a macho piece of acting. You know what I mean? He's weeping and he falls to his knees like a little boy and she comes down and holds his head in her lap and, and he cries and says, don't ever leave me. You don't ever leave me, baby. When you, when you start out as a guy in acting, a lot of what you're drawn to is a sense of like power in these performances, you know? You're, you're drawn to like Denzel and Glory and and, and De Niro and Raging Bull. And but that sense of danger that all comes from Brando. Well, yes, and, and Marlon Brando and Streetcar Named Zara, all these things. Because there's something in you when you're young, you want to perform that way. You want people to see your strength in a way, you know what I mean? Sure. And the, the more I go on, the more I work, the more my whole, my appreciation gets deeper and deeper for what I would say is like the, the hardest thing in acting, which is conveying that kind of vulnerability. But he, the thing that was kind of amazing, the reason I say ingenue is because he listened in a way it was very different the way the other actors listened before that. Yeah. Not the waterfront. Yeah, I, I think he, I, I genuinely think that as much as you can uh, say that someone changed everything, I think he changed everything as, as far as acting. And, and by the way, the interesting thing is, I talked about this one time too, uh, there, was a, there was a thing, uh, an AFI thing for Dustin Hoffman and and, I, and they asked me to talk at that, and I started, so I thought about, like, I thought about what Dustin Hoffman had, you know, and had meant to me, and he was such the antithesis on many levels of what had been a leading man up to that time. And that's kind of what I said. I think that people like me um, and Phil Hoffman and, you know, uh, Sean Penn and any number of actors today who aren't what you would call sort of matinee idol guys who are actors. People like Dustin Hoffman and Al Pacino and Robert De Niro and Robert Duvall shifted the paradigm from, um, from quote unquote leading actor, romantic leading actor, to character actor. They turned the character actor into the leading actor. Um, you what, know, what was in the Hoffman films that was, the, I guess The Graduate was obviously one of you, wasn't it? The, yeah, the, my, my parents loved it. I did see The Graduate early on and just, just could never get over that movie. I, I thought it was, I still think it's one of the greatest, greatest movies ever. Um, but I, I, I loved uh, Lenny. I think, I thought Le, Lenny, to me, at a young age, you know, Lenny's an incredibly raw film, really raw performance. Feels almost like a a documentary, you know, it's, I thought he was incredible in that. Are there any niggers here tonight? Let's see, there's two niggers, and between those two niggers sits a kike. And there's another kike, that's two kikes and three niggers. And there's a spick, right? Hmm? Ooh, there's a wop, there's a Polak, and a, oh, a couple of grease balls, <laughs> and there's three lace curtain Irish mitts, and there's one hip, thick, hunky, funky, boogie. Boogie, boogie. Mm -hmm. I got three cocks here. Do I hear five cocks? I got five cocks. Do I hear six picks? I got six picks. Do I hear seven niggas? I got seven niggas. Sold American. <laughs> you almost punched me out, didn't you? <laughs> well, I was just trying to make a point.
and that is that it's the suppression of the word that gives it the power, the violence, the viciousness.